Hi, I'm Sarah Casada with A Life with Subtitles, and I am excited today to introduce Janelle, who is a friend of mine, and she is very involved in working with immigrant kids and um, helping them through the process going on. And so I had written a post a while back um, about the documentary Which Way Home, and that kind of sparked some conversation, and I wanted to learn more, and I knew that she was involved in this work, and so I'm happy that she's willing to share a little bit with us. And so you've also seen that documentary, right? And mm -hmm. that was kind of part of getting involved in That was in part your of my training for my current current job where I'm working with the Unaccompanied Minor Program. Mm -hmm. okay. And we can't mention anything about where she works or who she works with, <laughs> uh, which makes us feel very like scandalous and stuff. But maybe you could just share a little bit about kind of what you do or what you've learned through your work. Yeah, so I um, work with kids um, they call them post-release services and home studies, so I work with kids who are currently detained in the shelter programs that are operated um, across the country, really, um, so that kids who are under 18 but don't cross the border with their parent or guardian um, are placed in shelters um, in, as they're looking, seeking reunification with their family members who are residing in the U.S. Um, so I say about 90% of the kids who come are eventually reunified with some type of family member um, here in the who's US. already here in the U.S. Okay. while they're waiting for their immigration proceedings to go through. Um, so that could be like a neighbor, it could be a mother or father, it could be a sister, brother, aunt, uncle. Um, but yeah, 90% of the kids who arrive have some type of connection where they can be released to um, while they're waiting for their immigration proceedings to go through. Okay, so that's not the end of the road for them <coughs> when they get connected with somebody here. That's just exactly. where they're staying. So from the time, so when a child is apprehended, it could be at the border and it could be they're grown up in the U.S. but got into juvenile detention mm -hmm. trouble or something like that. Um, but if they are turned over to ICE, they would go to um, a special program that's operated by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And they... Um, provide like group, it's more of a group home setting, there's foster families for younger kids, um, and there are more secure settings like more of a juvenile detention center for kids mm -hmm. who have um, known gang involvement or have different behaviors while they're in the, the shelter program um, or who have criminal history. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, most of the kids are in more of like a group home setting or a foster care setting. And so you're here in Georgia, mm -hmm. so which is not Texas or California or one of those places. So uh -huh. how is that? Are there group homes here in this area in the southeast or the the closest group home that I know of? There um, there are always new programs blossoming everywhere, but there's um, programs all over the country that or our um, office of youth development um, who they contract with. Um, so I have a case right now, and they were um, placed in Pennsylvania. Um, I think the closest one to us here in Atlanta is in Miami, but that might not be completely accurate. Um, so even if a kid gets apprehended at the border, they might end up in, in this area they, on your case? Mm -hmm, and it's wherever they have, um, so in the shelters, they're all across the country. So they might be apprehended in Texas or Arizona, um, and they might be sent to New York or Pennsylvania or Miami, just depending where they have space available. Um, I know that sometimes they'll try to get them closer to where they say they have family, but usually it's just in a, a capacity mm -hmm. um, situation. And then the reason I'm in here in Ge I'm here in Georgia is if their family members live here in Georgia, okay, um, then we work with the families once the kids are released from care, or if there's extra concerns like there's a trafficking concern or there's severe trauma. Um, or there's a, just a concern about how is this person related to the sponsor, like the facts aren't adding up, if there's discrepancies like mm -hmm. that, then they'll send um, one of us to do a home study before the kid's released. And so, um, so yeah, we kind of work in both of those ways. So what are the general ages of kids that you're working um, with? Most of the kids that we work with, I would say, are like 14 to 18, um, but I've had a kid as young as 15 months. <laughs> um, who came and she came with her sister who was three um, and they were just smuggled in by a family friend. Oh, wow. So someone that wasn't related to them. So when they came, all three were apprehended, but since they weren't with their parent or guardian, um, they were placed in OR care. So they were with an adult, this mm -hmm. isn't like a three-year-old carrying a baby. Right. But, ooh, gosh, I can't But it was even. like a distant relative. Like yeah. it wasn't anyone that they knew very well. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were 
they were referred to us because of potential trafficking, because yeah. sending such young kids with not really a relative. Um, yeah, it raises some red flags. Right, and mm -hmm. so that's how we got that case. So, but yeah, I've had other kids who are like a 16-year-old bringing three-year-old siblings, things like that. So, I mean, wow. kids are really young. All right, so we've had some technical difficulties. <laughs> we're back on track. Um, and so I wanted to ask Janelle because I've read a lot of articles, you know, you see tons of stuff. If you follow the kinds of Facebook pages I do, there's all different kinds of articles coming through and lots of different views on why kids are coming, why they're not coming, all of that stuff. And so I'm curious what your experience has been, what you're hearing from kids who are mm -hmm. making that journey. Um, I think well, with any kind of, what, this is kind of what I've learned in this job, is so in any kind of migration, there's push factors and pull factors. Um, and so with kids coming from Central America um, to the U.S. right now with that whole, um, the whole crisis of unaccompanied minors, um, there, I mean, Honduras, all, I think, I don't remember the percentage, but the majority of the kids, a huge majority, almost all of them are coming from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, mm -hmm. And those three countries are in some of the highest murder rate, have some of the highest murder rates per capita in the world right now, um, especially Honduras. And I think three cities in Honduras are in the top five. If that, I think that's yeah. correct. Um, but so you have huge um, gang violence, crime rates, cartel that are in the area, um, pushing drugs. So they're pushing drugs to the U.S. because there's demand in the U.S. So that's. Um, one of it was definitely of the push factors is just that and kids are saying dangerous. that's affecting their choices mm -hmm. and, and so much so that kids don't even say it because it's so normal mm -hmm. um, and so I had one kid and he was like oh yeah it was fine but then as I started asking him questions he was like oh well yeah well I have to pay this guy rent so that they don't so that the other gang members don't rob me on my way to get the money that my mom's sending me or like my aunt and uncle have to pay someone to guard our store so that they don't kill us basically yeah. um, but I've had multiple kids who were kind of held hostage by the gangs and like forced to join and they'll say um, I've had like probably five or six clients over the past couple years saying um, they were living with their grandparents and the gang member would come and say hey if you don't do this for me I'm gonna come back and kill your grandparents mm -hmm. or they're they know a friend and the friend didn't join and then their parent or someone in their family ends up being murdered and then now this kid is like okay I have to do this yeah. and so it's, it's pretty high stakes um, and lots of the girls are saying that they're being threatened and things like that um, there's just a lot a lot of violence um, and you were telling me a little bit earlier that <clears throat> if kids are deported from the US that that can actually make that situation worse and right. so I have, um, and that's something that I've heard from my family, it's where they have this huge fear that once you're identified as someone who has connections to the U.S., um, what a couple of families have told me is like, he can't go back now, like, if he gets a deportation order, we're just, we're not going to send him back because now they know he's been gone, they're going to know that he's come back, they're going to know he has ties to the U.S., um, and it's just a heightened level of danger. Um, is what, that's like what some because of my they think they me. can exploit that Ex resource yeah, exactly. for money and say, oh well, you have family in the U.S. If I kidnap you, then yeah. um, I'll get that back. So that's um, that. The violence in the area is definitely a huge um, push factor. Another push factor is just the economic opportunities and the lack of education. I think is another one um, where lots of these kids have. A first grade education. I would say yeah, and the majority of them have a, a sixth grade education, which is like primary school mm -hmm. um, in Central America. But it's still a huge deficit from where a sixth grader, if you have sixth grade education in the U.S., would be. Um, and I like from what I've seen, especially kids in Guatemala have a huge lack of education, where um, like their parents have to pay for them to go to school, yeah. and so they just can't afford it. Like they. Um, they're saying like we're eating tortillas and salt. Like we can't afford to go to school if we can barely afford to feed our families. Sure. Um, and Priority. so yeah, and so I think um, that you got and just like not being able to find work. Um, all of my kids were like, well, I couldn't. There was no work. Um, I just got. I just had a visit last week with a kid that were let, was, say, was saying that um, his family is renting a house that's falling down, and he's the oldest. His dad's sick and going blind. 
Um, and so he came because he had another choice. He's the oldest. It's his responsibility right. to make sure that his siblings don't starve. Mm -hmm. um, and so then he's apprehended at the border and faced with this decision of, I'm not supposed to work, but I owe like $3,000 for the, uh, the guide that brought me here. Um, so I have this debt. Now you're telling me I have to go to school because I'm only 14, but I've been working since I was five. Yeah. So it's just like the expectations that we put on a lot of kids are just unrealistic. And so he even told me, he's like, if I had my father here, I was coming to my father, then I would go to school. Of course I would go to school, but like he said, I, I'm not blessed in that way. And so it's just like really heartbreaking to know that like he would love to go to school <clears throat> and like required by law in the U.S. to go to school in most states, most yeah. states until you're 16. Mm -hmm. um, but it just doesn't meet the reality of his life. And so, um, yeah. Let me ask you this, because this is one thing <coughs> that really caught me off guard in Which Way Home, which is sort of mm -hmm. my reference point for this issue, was the, the semi-frequent, it was mentioned more than once, of I'll go to the U.S. and I'll be adopted by a family there. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing that misconception from kids? So I haven't heard all my kids, most of the kids I'm working with, have a family contact in the U.S. So I'm working with that 90% that has family here. Um, so I haven't, none of my kids that I've worked with have said Say that, that specifically. Um, but some of them don't really understand that once you get here, like once they're, because they're apprehended, released to their parents, and the shelters do a lot of education, like you're being placed in removal proceedings. You have to go to court, you have to mm -hmm. find an attorney, you have to do all these things. Um, but at the same time, they don't, I, I think the last times they come without that underst understanding the reality of yeah. what that means. That makes sense. <coughs> um, um, well, it's getting a little dark, and, <laughs> and so I, don't, I could just keep talking about it, but I wanted to see if there was any last things you wanted to share or anything that you kind of was like, if there's one thing you need to know about this topic, it's this, or... Um. Um, so I feel like a lot of us, there's a, there's a heart tug, especially when you're talking about kids mm -hmm. that are, that are taking this really dangerous journey and, and get here and there's kind of, you know, it's just this really tense tension situation of there's not a great solution. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, we sort of want to know how to help and I don't know if there's ways that you can suggest we could even be an advocate or yeah, support I know in any that, way. Um, there are some organizations um, in different immigration courts around the country that do um, different programs around accompanying kids to court so they don't show up by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ton of kids who just need rides to court and like find, being connected with people in those ways is a little bit more difficult. Um, but that's a huge barrier of like, lots of people just don't have, they have to travel six hours to the closest immigration court. Maybe not mm -hmm. six, that might be pushing it, but like definitely four yeah. to the closest immigration court and it's just hard. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing is just remembering to see them as kids. I think lots of times we're like, even in the schools, like the schools talk about my kids and they're like, well, they do this and they do this and they do this and they do this. But just realizing that there's a huge amount of trauma that happens, even just in coming to the U.S. Sure. Um, and just like, the sep there's just so many issues. Like I've been separated from my mom for 10 years and I'm 16. I don't even know who she is. And kind of like reintegrating families. So there's like cultural things that then happen once sure. and just like separation there's like so it's just a really really complex issue that has tons of needs and I think for me it's just remembering that these are children and like even yeah. if even if it's not like economically sustainable or like there's so many needs they need medical care and they need schooling and they need all this stuff um I think just like keeping in mind that their kids and like their parents are here and even if their parents are undocumented like wouldn't we want a family to be able to be together? Yeah. And so I think that, um, yeah, I think working in this job has definitely made me realize how um, I should take it for granted those simple things that I grew mm -hmm. up with my mom and dad, you know what I mean? And they weren't, didn't have to go and yeah. go to a different country and work and stuff like that. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that I think of. Well, thank you so much yeah, for definitely. sharing a little insight. We've got bugs. Um, <laughs> insight into kind of what you've learned and experienced mm -hmm. working in this field and appreciate you sharing. Yeah, definitely. Until next time. <laughs>